Hi, I'm Josh. Welcome to the Retro Room. This is what I hope to be the first in a series of repair videos. I occasionally take on repair jobs for 8-bit micros, so I thought I would start documenting my experience and sharing it with the internet in the hopes that this is useful and enjoyable. So let's get started. Here on the bench we have a Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 100 portable computer. As you can see, the condition is somewhat dirty, and also it's got, someone has colored in the numeric keypad uh, red keys here. And this stuff, I think, is, is fairly well on there. It's like paint or something. It, it doesn't come off easily, so I guess whoever used this did a lot of numeric entry and wanted to be able to zip their eyes uh, quickly to the number keys. Also, there's some adhesive residue around the model badge here. And it's just, you know, generally a fairly well-used, slightly dirty machine. The LCD looks fairly unscratched, though, so that's pretty good. And now, around back, turning it over, is a note I think that I made to myself there at Tandy Assembly, or that uh, the gentleman made. I think this indicates that the battery has already been cut out. That's one of the first things that you want to do to any of these machines, is get rid of the battery if it's original. And it says, clean what won't boot. Now, I have another sheet here, that I, a note I made to myself. that says that uh, PSU is okay and won't boot blank screen. So, probably what happened is I got a chance to just crack this thing open on the show floor and ascertain that the power supply was okay, but didn't want to go any further there. If we open up the ROM door, we can see this one has a PCSG Super ROM in it. I don't know if you can read that text on there. Uh, the per, uh, Portable Computer Support Group, I think is what that is, PCSG Inc. And the Super ROM had a couple of their utilities on it and that you could uh, get into with the basic uh, call 63012 command. Uh, the battery compartment, open that up. That looks pretty good. No obvious signs of corrosion in there, and that's good. The last one of his that I worked on, the AA compartment, it was a Model 200, and the AA's had leaked in and corroded a bunch of stuff on the keyboard PCB, and that was causing the symptoms that he saw of not being able to use several of the keys. So, let's go ahead and get this thing open and take a look. Okay, so this one's actually missing... Uh, one of the four screws is the four screws around the outside that, that hold the case together. Uh, two down here. I'm sorry, my camera field of view doesn't quite get the whole machine in the shot. But at this point, basically stand it up and get a fingernail right in there. And one down here on this catch. And it basically flops open. So now we have the top LCD and keyboard PCB and the bottom system PCB. So we're going to focus on the bottom board right now. So right off the bat we can see this is a 32K unit because it's got all four banks populated. It was sold as an 8K unit because this one is soldered in and the other three were added later. Although I guess it could have been sold like this but it was one of the earlier manufactured ones. It only had one of the modules soldered. Later module, later units you'll see have uh, these three modules soldered and only the, the final, what they call the option RAM, in a socket. But this one's fully populated, that's good. We're going to disconnect the LCD board and disconnect the, I don't know if that's the beeper or the battery LED. Uh, just to get those out of the way so I can get a probe in there and take a look at it. So what we want to do here is we're going to get a meter. And I'm going to set it over here, I think, we'll be able to be in the shot. And just take a look at the, very, at the state of the power supply. Now I've got a genuine Tandy Model 100 power supply right here, so I'm going to plug that in. And this is our power switch. It's, you can see the silk screen on the board on and off, or maybe you can see it and you can't. We're going to turn that on. And then it's usually a pretty good place to get a ground is just right here on the battery terminal. And there's a number of 
places on the board that are labeled. So this test point here, VB, that's showing 5.20 volts, which is about what you'd expect. This unit doesn't have the NICAD in, as I, uh, as the note mentioned earlier, the battery had been cut out. So the VB rail is, is going to go a little higher. Normally it would be uh, pretty much dead on 5. Unless, of course, our 5 volt supply is bad. The VEE, that's the minus 5 supply, and that is reading minus 5. And then finally the VDD, which is the plus 5 supply. That is slightly high, but not really problematic. So yeah, power supply is good. Turn this back on. I'm going to actually measure the memory power rail on the chip. And I've, I've swapped my lead, so it's showing minus 5, but that is showing that we are in fact getting 5 volts to the memory power. So the memory power rail is good on this. So nothing dragging all that down. Uh, major problems we would see on a Model 100 is this is the power supply section of the board, and a number of these capacitors are known to go bad. Uh, C85, I'm looking for C82. Uh, that's it right there. Uh, these capacitors are especially known to go bad. So I'm going to actually flip this closed. Let me move my meter. And let's see what we see now. All right. Well, the LCD contrast, a viewing angle pot is working, so that's good. Uh, I suspected that was good anyway because the 5 volts is there. But something is just not running. It's either not running the processor or not showing the display. So one of the things we can do, if we hit Control, Break, and then the reset key is back here. Sort of have to get that with my other finger. All right, Control, Break, Reset. That does a full what they call a cold start. And now this, the, if we could see the menu, we would be seeing the basic is selected. So I'm going to hit enter. And then I can hit B E E P, enter. And we don't hear a beep. So it's a pretty good sign that it's not running blind. It's probably not running at all. So now I think it's time to get out the scope. All right, there is actually one more thing we should do, what I should have done before which is to remove the Super ROM, just to make sure that it's not having any problems, because this is on the uh, bus. So if there were a problem with this module, and these modules are kind of interesting. The the pinout in this option ROM socket is not the JEDEX standard of what you would see on a, like a 27256. It is, of course, weird. And so this carrier board is designed to swap around several of the, the pins and the signals to make the standard, if I peeled away this, it would, you would just see it's, it's a standard EEPROM. I can feel the window underneath there. And so this is designed to remap the pins from the standard EEPROM, or EEPROM rather, into the pinout that this option ROM module accepts. So with this module, with this uh, super ROM out, let's put this over again, reconnect the external power, and turn that on. Yep, same thing. Let me do a cold start again. Enter, B-E-E-P, enter, nothing. So, all right, time to start probing. So I've got the scope out, and it's a little difficult to see. It's really hard to get a good angle on this. But I'm, I've got my ground here on just a ground test point on the board. This normally runs to the underboard shield. But I'm just probing one of the address data pins. The 8085 uses a multiplexed address data bus, so the pins are, are shared. And just getting no activity on the address data bus. Um, now if I look over here, the clock should be this fourth pin right here. And yeah, just not getting any of the signals that I would expect to be seeing on the CPU. This is the CPU here, the 80C85. I think this one's an Oki manufactured part. Um, so yeah, very, very dead. Uh, so I'm going to have to go back to the technical reference manual and see if I can, can trace the clock signal, figuring out uh, where the clock is. 
I didn't see a reset either. I think the reset is the next one over. So if I turn this on, yeah, it, it jumps briefly with some weird DC offset, but that's it. Okay, so I've gone ahead and removed the extra RAM modules. I wasn't seeing a clock signal, so I'm not actually thinking this is going to make a big difference. But just for the sake of completeness, let's take a look. I've also gone ahead and removed the LCD and keyboard uh, PCB because they're not important to the current testing. Let me get my uh, ground connection back. Switch hands to make this a little easier. Yeah, nothing. And if we go back to the clock, one, two, three, four. Yeah, nothing. Okay, so just to confirm that I had the scope set up correctly and was expecting to see what I was expecting to see, I got my known good uh, Model 100 out of the plastic tub. You can see it has three different uh, RAM modules. This one's actually not quite fully inserted, looks like. Um, but anyway, I verified this is this is normal. This is functioning normally. So we're going to turn it on here, and I'm going to probe one of the address data lines. And yeah, that's what we're expecting to see. This thing's actually doing some talking. Yeah, and if I come up here, and get this little capacitor kind of in the way, but put this right on the clock signal. Yeah, a nice stable clock at uh, 2.45 megahertz, which I believe is the correct frequency. It's about 2.4 something uh, that this 8085 runs, so that's good. You can come over here and just uh, take a look at this uh, crystal, 4.9, it's crystal's labeled 4.915, my scope's reading 4.90, that's probably fine, the scope hasn't been calibrated in ever, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept that that's good. So that's what we should be seeing with a properly functional machine. Also, let me come up here and one, two, three, four, five. Let's take a look at the reset line. Milliseconds, really crank this up. It's low, pulses low, then pulses high. All right, so that's the proper functioning of a Tandy Model 100. All right, before we go any further, I'm just going to go ahead and pop this board out, take a look at the underside, make sure there's no surprises. I uh, could be dealing with corrosion on the underside that I can't see. This guy right here, you have to pay a little bit of attention to. This is connected to a little standoff and has a little rubber bumper. This supports the center of the keyboard when the keyboard sits down on this. If you lose this or if you lose the, the rubber cap, if you lose it all, the keyboard will flex and you can break, break traces that way. If you lose this little rubber cap here, you've got hard plastic rubbing against traces on the PC board. You can damage that. So make sure you don't lose those two when you disassemble one of these. Also, I find that the clearance on these two bottom screws is usually very tight and you sometimes have to press the logic board up when you reinstall these screws because the alignment is off by, I don't know, a fraction of a millimeter, enough to make it annoying to get the screws back in. Alright, so I can take this last piece, last center support off. those together because this screw is different than the other screws as well and this thing should come loose now the, the couple of tricks here this reset button will want to get stuck and also these battery terminals sort of need to give them a little help getting getting up because they like to stick down inside the battery holder and now we can pull this board out Now, underneath it, you have a little RF shield, and if there's, if you're dealing with bad corrosion problems, you'll see evidence of it all over the bottom of this piece. But with the board out, 
sort of take a look. There's nothing obvious, no big pools of green. I didn't think I'd find any because I'm not seeing any evidence on this machine of corrosion. Like I said, a previous machine had really bad corrosion. I had to repair a bunch of traces on the keyboard PCB. But this one looks okay. Not seeing anything that jumps out at me. Okay, so now I have opened yet a third Model 100. This is just one of my parts machines. You can see I've already scavenged a lot of stuff off it, like the, the tran uh, transformer here and the UART. This one in. So this, this board here has given a lot of its parts to save other 100s. And hopefully we're going to be able to do that again. This machine suffered pretty massive corrosion. You can see all the damage through here. And I just decided it wasn't worth fixing. So we're going to go ahead and get the vacuum desoldering gun. And hopefully I'll be able to do this. And just, just yank this crystal out of here on the off chance that that's what the problem is. So the crystal is these two pins right here. Hopefully that's visible enough. And we're just going to get this guy over it. These legs are really long. And bingo. Set this board aside. Take our hopefully repairable board. Put this crystal over there. I think I have a pen. I'm just going to mark this guy with a little dot so I know which one it is. Um, I haven't confirmed if it's good or bad, so I'm not going to mark it bad yet. But let's just try and get it out of there. Bingo. Put that over with the parts from that machine. Take our probably good, can't actually confirm it because of all the damage to that other machine, but probably good crystal. Pop that in there. Turn that over and now I'm going to get just a little bit of flux. This is probably overkill, but it makes things really, really easy. And these are old parts and who knows how much corrosion there could be on the legs. So, just make it easy on myself. We've got, I, I like to use uh, this Chip Quick 6337 uh, tin lead solder. And it's uh, very thin, because I originally bought it when I was starting to do surface mount work, and I discovered it's just really good all around solder. Let's just go ahead and get this guy back on there. Under that joint. There we go. Inspect that. Looks pretty good. Um, because it is a crystal, I'm just going to take some isopropanol here and try to clean up some of the flux down there in case it affects the resonance and circuit these tandy boards have so m this 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 flux is not all for me these these tandy boards have so much factory flux on them all right it's good flip this guy over turn the scope on again i'm sorry it's off camera Hey, you can you can almost see it. Stand here. All right. Now let's probe that clock line. Ooh, look at that. That's different.
Frequency 2.43 megahertz. Maybe that was the problem. Um, let's get over here and look at the address data bus. Oh, yeah, now we're seeing activity. Maybe this guy just had a dead crystal. Let's go ahead and put it back together. So just to get the system back together enough to test with, I've reattached the keyboard and LCD, the top case, and then just flipped the whole thing over. I can still get, I, I'm not gonna be scoping anything, I'm just gonna be testing for functionality. So reapply power, turn this on. Oh, saw something there for a second. Look what we've got. We've got a functioning Model 100. Adjust the contrast so the camera can see it. So we'll go into basic here. Beep. And it beeps. Look at that. Quick basic test. Keyboard is a little funky, needs cleaning. But we've got it. We're running basic. Um, break. Menu, we hear the text program, Let's check our keyboard, that looks good. Okay, now that we've got the machine functional again, it's running, let's, there's a couple more things I want to do to this one. Uh, I mentioned the memory battery was missing earlier. So we're going to want to put a replacement of that in there and then need to reinstall uh, the option RAM modules and retest, make sure everything's okay with all the RAM installed. So while the soldering iron heats up, I'm going to grab the battery. So this is the memory battery. It's a 3.6 volt. It was nickel cadmium in the original uh, machine, but... I have lots of good luck replacing them with uh, nickel metal hydrides, and they're a lot easier to get hold of, because I know I have more jobs coming in. People wanting the memory batteries replaced. The memory battery, of course, is the most crucial thing to get this thing out of there before it leaks. You can replace it with one of these. You can actually run these machines without the memory battery. They're perfectly happy with without it. You just don't have the protection in case your main power supply or main uh, batteries go flat. Now this one, if you can kind of see, there's a bit of a leg left there. This one was clipped out. It wasn't unsoldered. So I'm going to have to get in here on these two fat traces and unsolder these pins so I can get the new battery in. Oh, <laughs> I actually pulled the pin out with the vacuum tool. So I'll need to get that out. There's a pair of tweezers. All right, well good, that pin came out easily. I was wondering why it wouldn't go over this other uh, solder joint. All right, that one left the pin in, so I'll have to pull it out. I'm going to use a pair of clippers. Oh, it's still in there. The other side. Sometimes these guys will get bent or they'll get corroded. And it makes it really difficult to remove. I can feel it is loose though. So. There we go. Got it out. And then... install the battery. Silk screen is nicely marked. Positive there, negative there. Um, I'm going to turn the memory power switch off as I do this. I just want to get these legs down to those holes. It's a pretty good friction fit. So it stays put when I solder it. And then definitely going to apply some flux 
on this one. And what I'm using here is MG Chemicals 8341. Um, this is a flux that was recommended to me by a couple of folks on Twitter, and it really does work considerably better than the liquid flux pen, the Kester 186 that I was using before. So, glad to know about that. And, get the iron. Where did I put my solder? So, go ahead and get this guy all soldered up. Yeah, this, these battery legs sometimes don't want to wet for some reason. This one seems okay. This one here, it, it wetted on one side at least. I don't know, something about these, this batch of batteries that I have. Even with the flux, they can be a little, little pesky. So now, if we flip this over, go ahead and turn the memory power back on. Get our meter in the shot. And we can measure the battery rail. Again, I'm going to go to ground right here in this battery terminal. And then this leg right here is called VB. That's the, v, the battery voltage. I put probe on that. 3.13, which is about what we expect. It's about 0.5 volts down from the actual voltage of the battery itself. 0 0.4, 0 0.5, yeah, because there's a there's a protection diode in there. But it looks good. And reinstall these RAM modules. Just get these guys into these. These are very nice uh, machine pin sockets these RAM modules go into. These don't look like, well, they're definitely not Tandy. Let's see what they are. Uh, Purple Computing M100S, if you can read that. 1985 date code. So, yeah, aftermarket RAM expansion. As I said, this, ma this machine was probably initially produced with only 8K. And I've seen these modules before. I believe they're just fine. A uh, number, of, number of machines that have come through have had them in there. So now we're going to reinstall the board into the bottom case. You want to make sure that your little spacers, because these little discs come off, and they're only in some, only on some of these uh, screw bosses, not on others. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. So let's get that reset switch on, into there, and then press it forward. We've got to get these battery terminals into the plastic notches in the battery holder portion of the case. And I did not get that in there correct. You need both the left and the right sides to go into the little plastic holders there to secure it in place. And then, yeah, it kind of snaps down. Give a good solid feel. Make sure those are bottomed out. This reinstallation can be a little bit of a pain. All right, re reconnect the ground pin, the bottom case. Let's get the DC power jack reinstalled. Uh, before I do that, I want to find my screwdriver and get the internal case screws. Remember I mentioned this guy right here, the center support for the keyboard. You want to make sure this is, oops, you want to make sure this is on the underside of the screw, not the, over, not the, not above it. 
and then get your plastic bumper back on top of the peg there. And these two bottom screws, like I said, sometimes they you have to really press the board up to get these things to start threading into those threaded inserts. And oh, finish snugging this one up. And we've got it. And my vacuum gun has gone into power save. I can turn that off. Reconnect the LCD, the keyboard, and I did figure out this is the low power LED. Those connected, we just flip the top case back over and it snaps down. test. Oh, turn the memory power back on. System won't power up or do anything if the memory power switches off. Turn the power on and boom we are running basic. Well, okay now we're running basic. that off because that is no longer has any faults. We're going to go ahead and reinstall the uh, Super ROM and that just presses in there. It's, it's got that spacer on the bottom that's designed to keep it from going too far and should hopefully make contact with that Molex socket. Reconnect power, turn it on, the little document we created there earlier is still there, so we know the memory battery is working. That's good. So we're going to go into basic. Whoops. Have the number lock key turned on. Call 63012. And there we are. So this is the PCSG Super ROM. Uh, the Lucid, I believe, is a database, maybe. Uh, write ROM. That's the... Uh, word processor enhancement, file size one, words zero, go ahead and edit it, yeah this keyboard is funky, needs cleaning, go back out here, now words 10, file size 60, so it, it adds a bunch of uh, other features to, that the standard built-in Microsoft text editor doesn't have. And there, this is the little stub that it puts into the basic into the menu, so you can access the Super ROM. So it's pretty cool. I never run this. I have Rex's in mind, so I can run uh, ROM software just from images. I don't think I've ever run this particular one. Okay, the last thing I want to do before I declare victory here is test the serial port on this. We're going to do this in Telcom. I need to hook up a serial device to it. So uh, I've got a gender uh, null modem cable here and a gender changer. A genuine Radio Shack no modem as well. And then this USB serial port is hooked up to my phone and I'm just running a program called MCOM. And this emulates a Tandy portable disk drive, but it also will inject the DOS loader as well. So um, we need this gender changer also because this port here is female even though this device is data terminal equipment, DTE, it's backwards from what we would consider to be the standard today. So anyway, this long complicated set of adapters to get it plugged into my phone. I can go over here into Telcom and we're gonna stat 98N1E 
stat command telling I'm setting the serial port uh, configuration. 9 is one of the codes, 1 through 9, that designates which baud rate, in this case 19.2. 8 data bits, no parity, 1 stop bit, and E to enable flow control. And then we're going to go term. And so I'm going to go here and tap the command to load DOS. And what it's doing is it's going to upload a basic program. And if I were in basic, I would have run a, a little stub command. But basically, this is just going to start uh, transferring. It's transferring a program that would basically poke uh, TS-DOS into RAM. But we can see it here, and all we needed to do was verify that the serial port is working. So I think we've got a good machine. And I'm now ready to finally declare victory. So, thanks for watching, and uh, maybe I'll do a few more of these videos later. I have a few more machines in the queue that need repair, and uh, hopefully everyone uh, finds this interesting. So, thanks a lot.